and I said, hey, uh, any tips for getting good at the smother? And he said, yeah, step one, be 300 pounds. Step two, smother. Step three, make everyone hate you. Step four, profit. <laughs> What's the most efficient path to victory against this particular opponent? He's dropping off for the choke here. We could see the finish. It's looking tight. Tight to Delbra. Hey guys, welcome to the Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kwan. The Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about Jiu-Jitsu. This week, we're going to discuss the mounted position, making mount your favorite position. Before we talk about mount, Please, I ask you to like, share, and subscribe to the show. Share the content wherever you can. Leave comments in the comment sections, even the rude ones. It really helps my algorithm. If you want to support or contact the show, I'll leave the links in the bottom for you. Also, before we talk about the mounted position, just want to let you know what is coming up for me next. If you're listening to this episode, I am in Las Vegas and... This week is Masters Worlds, IBJJF Masters Worlds, and also IBJJF Jiu-Jitsu Con, formerly known as the Las Vegas Open. There's three tournaments, Masters Worlds, Jiu-Jitsu Con Gi, and Jiu-Jitsu Con No Gi. Both Jiu-Jitsu Con tournaments are adult divisions. I believe there is no Masters division. At least there wasn't when I last looked. I am signed up for all three tournaments. I'm doing the middleweight division. I'm a pretty small uh, middleweight. I'm... Normally a lightweight, but I've put on some extra muscle over the last year or so, and I'm trying a run at middleweight. Um, I feel a little bit outstrengthened in the gi, but in no gi, I don't feel outstrengthened at all. But as you guys know, if you're listeners, I am more natural at no gi. Um, I'm looking forward to this tournament. Jiu-Jitsu Con is always fun. Even though I don't really like Las Vegas too much, I find it kind of a scummy... Uh, fake town where everything is for sale and nothing is real. But at the same time, I'm going with some teammates and I have some kids competing as well. It's going to be a fun trip regardless. And uh, just just good times doing the biggest jujitsu tournament of the year, at least in the IBJJF platform. So that is what I'll be preparing for. I fight in Masters Worlds on Thursday. And then Friday, I have both my gi and no gi division for jujitsu con. It will be fun. All right. Let's discuss the mounted position. I'd like to first talk about how my opinion has changed uh, over my 15 years of grappling experience about the mounted position. Now, if you think about mount, it's actually the same position as a closed guard, but it's just inverted. Okay, so, um, you know, think of the closed guard. Now you're upside down. That is the mounted position. So you still have uh, dominance over your partner with your legs. They do not have the ability to make space and make distance with their legs. Just like in the closed guard, your hips are actually higher than your partner's hips. In the mounted position, again, your hips are higher than your partner's hips, but you are now past their legs, okay? Um, <clears throat> I used to avoid them going to the mounted position. I preferred positions such as side control, north-south, because I felt that they were more stable, okay? And this is actually a pretty common thing in jiu-jitsu, I find, at least with some of the uh, lesser experienced athletes, a lot of people avoid mount because they feel that it's kind of a precarious position where you can easily fall off and get bucked off. Okay. Um, mount takes time to develop. Okay. It's not a position that you can easily go to and feel comfortable with. You'll always see lower ranked athletes go to mount and then immediately they lose the position or immediately their partner recovers their guard. They fall over. Okay. I'd like to discuss a bunch of different things today, including controls and how you can improve your mount position um, and really make it a position that you find effective and that you'll like to put your training partners in for long periods of time where you can uh, morally, mentally defeat them and sort of suck their souls out of their body. Uh, I think a lot of the reason why practitioners feel uncomfortable holding the mount position is because they don't understand what uh, what they need to do to hold their partner down. They think just using their body weight is enough to control someone, but just like any pin in jiu-jitsu, body weight is never just enough to hold a top pin position. Um, they don't understand why they keep losing the position. So they, they get to mount, they try and hold it by, you know, applying body weight, and then before you know it, they're out. 
or the, the bottom player is out. And they're like, man, why would I even use this position if I can't even hold it for long periods of time? You got to understand what does the defender need to escape the mount, right? Understanding your, uh, your opponent's needs when they're defending the mount is a critical step in shutting down their escapes. Like being heavy and applying your weight is not enough to just hold mount. I believe that in jiu-jitsu, to be like a true master of jiu-jitsu, I don't like the word master because I feel like jiu-jitsu is a skill that you can never really master. There's always someone who's better than you. There's always things that you can learn. So I don't like, uh, I don't like the term master, but really to be like a grappling master or a high, high level athlete in jiu-jitsu, you have to be comfortable in the mount position. Your game will never be complete until you feel comfortable going to mount. I think it's fair to say that in a lot of gi competition, a lot of athletes prefer going to the back. And I used to be one of those athletes. And I'm going to talk about reasons why or why not I prefer mount over the back, okay? And like I said, this position for me is pretty relatively new. I've only been really seeking the mount and looking to mount my partner uh, in competition for about a year now, not even, okay? Because I just came off of some injuries and stuff. But as I came back, I really wanted to look at that position and say, why do I not like that position? How can I make it a position that is uh, really working for me? I watch guys like Gordon Ryan who mounts people and they just can't escape. There's just no way that they get out. I'm wondering like, what is he doing that is making that position so effective, okay? Obviously, in positions, uh, in sports like MMA and other forms of combat, you know, you get to mount, you can punch someone in the face. In jiu-jitsu, you can't punch someone in the face. So, and, and even in nogi, it becomes more difficult to actually attack someone because they're not wearing a gi. You can't threaten strangles with the collars and whatnot. Like, how can you make this a position that you actually want to go to when it seems that side control and rear mount have so many more submission options available? Um, I'd actually like to share my experience with, uh, with the mount when my mindset kind of switched. And that was when I fought Bruno Frazado at the Las Vegas Open right before COVID. It was either 2018 or 2019. I'll link the match in the description at the bottom. It's on YouTube. And I met him in the finals of the Las Vegas Open in the adult lightweight division. And um, he mounted me. And I could feel him uh, cross-facing me every time I tried to hit a knee elbow escape. As I was fighting, I remember thinking like, man, there's not much I can do. Like uh, the match started pretty even, but then he was able to get to a guard position off of a reset. I should, I, I, I'd pulled guard before him. And then after we reset, I walked to the center rather than scooting to the center. And then when the match restarted, I had realized my, my flaw. I, I was in a uh, standing position when I wished that I was seated and he managed to pull guard before me. And then from there, he was able to sweep me, hit a nice pass off of an underhook and mount me. And then I remember being in mount and not really feeling overly threatened with submissions, but feeling like I can't really do much to escape. Every time I'd try to escape, he would cross face me. He would turn me away from my knee elbow escape with the cross face. He was doing some things where I was like, huh, I'm actually learning a lot during this match, even though this sucks. And I feel like, you know, I'm, I, and I lost that match. Um, as the match was progressing, I was losing, but I was also learning. I was, I was learning like, oh, what is he doing to hold the position and make it an effective position for him? Keep in mind, uh, I was nowhere near the level of, uh, skill and understanding of jiu-jitsu that I am now. You know, we're talking like basically five years later, four or five years later, and, uh, heel hooks weren't even allowed in the black belt division at this time. So a lot has changed since then, but that was a really good critical match for me. You know, I'd come off four submissions that day going to the finals and then fought Bruno, who's a legend. And he was just, he was just able to shut me down and outclass me that day with position, um, positional dominance, dominance. And, uh, I learned a lot from that match. You know, I looked at Mount differently from that match and I can remember wanting to be better at Mount after that match and wanting to use it the way that Bruno used it against me. Let's talk about some advantages from the mount position. So why would we go there? I think that one of the biggest advantages, and Danaher talks about this a lot, is the ability to be able to block your opponent's breathing. If you can block your opponent's breathing, it creates panic and it also exhausts your opponent. 
and it, it, it they panic because they're worried about their next breath as opposed to what their next jujitsu move is going to be. They're just thinking about their next breath. I find this incredibly useful and it's one of the only positions that you can do this in because you can just put your chest on your partner's face. You know, if you're all sweaty and you're in a rash guard and you put your rash guard on your partner's face, it's much like the smother and, you know, water's going uh, or sweat is going into their mouth and their nose and their eyes. It's horrible. Uh, like I said, they're struggling to breathe. Quite often their arms will come up and they will try to make space to uh, allow them to breathe. They're more concerned about breathing than they are about their escape. And that is a huge advantage, okay? Being able to exhaust and make your opponent panic is huge. Uh, another thing is your opponent carries your weight. So in positions like a rear mount position, um, your opponent necess doesn't necessarily carry your weight. A lot of the time when you have the back, they're facing up towards the ceiling and you are behind them, all right? So being on top of someone, putting your weight into someone can be really morally defeating and uh, exhausting for the person on the bottom. Think about in a side control position, often your opponent will be able to turn away and turtle because they're not in between your two knees. However, when you mount someone and an opponent turtles, what that does is expose their back because they're in between your two knees. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I can remember why Craig Jones, when he talks about power ride, he talks about how he always recommends that guy's pass to mount rather than to side control because, you know, he's he's gearing his instructional towards ADCC rule sets and he's saying, you know, you want to keep your score and if they turtle away when you pass the guard to side control, there is no score. But if you pass to mount, now they turtle away, they expose their back, okay? And it's just more of an advantageous, um, an advantageous position to be in off of the turtle. Also keep in mind, like I'd mentioned, in MMA, ground and pound is more available. So mount position as opposed to side control. In MMA, there's just so many more ways we can land damage from mount as opposed to side control. And again, if your opponent turtles, they now are exposing their back. Let's also contrast IBJJF and ADCC uh, rule sets for mount. I did ADCC Vancouver a couple of weeks ago. Next week, I'm doing IBJJF, so I'm, I'm making like a quick switch in terms of rule sets. Very different rule set, very different competition. Um, first of all, IBJJF, if you sweep someone while you're mounted, it's not a sweep, it's a reversal, meaning you didn't establish a guard first, so you're not going to get points for that. So if I'm in bottom mount and then I roll you over and we end up in a closed guard, I don't get anything for that, and I just gave you your, your guard back. And it's a closed guard, which means... For me to become offensive at all, I now need to break the closed guards, usually standing up and then start to go into my passing, right? And I have been in competition before where I got mounted, I couldn't escape, and then my opponent literally grabs me around the head and just rolls over into closed guard. And now I'm on the bottom in closed guard, or I'm on top in their closed guard, and if you're going against someone who is really better than you, which is which was the case in this situation, I was fighting a guy named Paulo Costa, um, this guy pulled me into closed guard and I was trying to get on like, man, I can't get out of this guy's closed guard. This sucks. This guy's like much stronger than me. And then he, he was able to sweep me to mount again and get uh, another six points, you know, and then uh, this is something that can happen over and over again. You go to mount, you fall to the bottom position, you sweep again, get six points, fall back. And the IBJJ rule set is brutal for that because if you get caught in that, you're going to get um, the scoreboard is going to have a huge difference in the score very, very quickly. Whereas ADCC, there is no cumulative points. There is no sweeping to mount is worth six. You would only get, uh, it would be a clean sweep though. It would be a four point score. However, in ADCC, if it's a reversal, so let's say I'm in top mount and I get bucked over to close guard, or maybe I pull you into close guard, uh, that counts as a sweep. I actually like that rule. I think that that is more realistic. I think if you're on the top position in mount, and you get reversed to the bottom position, but the bottom player intended to do that and they land with control, it should be a sweep. I don't really care for the rule where, you know, you have to establish a guard first. And um, as far as I know, the IBJJF, when they came to Vancouver to do the rule seminar, the referee said, uh, you know, they they base the rule set, off, uh, they prioritize the bottom athlete retaining their guard so that they can't just sweep from side control because there are reversals you can do from side control. And I remember thinking, 
well, that's not really like a good reason. You know, you're still moving from bottom to top position with control. I still think it should be a sweep because there are legitimate reversals from there. Now in ADCC, if I initiate a submission, if I'm in mount and I go for an arm bar, because I initiated the arm bar and I fall on the bottom into the guard, that is not a reversal. That is the top person initiating a submission and therefore they have the right to fall to the bottom position. Um, keep in mind too, in terms of calls to action for stalling and whatnot, IBJJF, you go to mount someone, you can literally just hold them there the entire match. You don't have to move at all. There is no stalling while you're in the mounted position. Whereas in ADCC, when you are, no, you're not going to come up here, Clay, go away. Stupid cat. Um, in ADCC, if you're in mount position and you stop moving, you can get penalized for this. I don't agree with that. I think if you hold mount and you're in such a dominant position, arguably the most dominant position in the sport, you should be able to just hold it indefinitely and you shouldn't have to move. It should be on the bottom player to escape. That's my opinion. Okay, but ADCC, the refs still want to see you progress. They want to see you start digging for underhooks or start working for smothers or cross faces or whatever, but you have to be moving. Otherwise, you're going to start getting called and start taking negatives. Okay, let's talk about disadvantage of mount position. So, um, Probably one, there's not many disadvantages to the mount position. The only one that I can really think about is that the opponent, if they hit, let's say a kipping escape, because they are in between your legs and they have the inside position, they can go immediately into Ashigarami. They can attack leg locks right away. They can attack sweeps right away. And back in the day when leg locks were relatively new on the scene, you would see the Danaher team even sometimes let people mount them use the kipping escape and just enter immediately into the legs. I remember seeing Oliver Taza do this multiple times, just lie down in the competition, which is insane, and let his opponent mount him and then hit a kipping escape, which no one was really clear about how to do, and then start attacking heel hooks, which again, at the time, nobody really knew how to stop that. And that was a, a kind of a cool, cool display of just a huge difference in the understanding of the modern leg lock game with the Danher team and everyone else. So big disadvantage is if you do get off balanced and your partner kips, now they can transition directly into leg attacks. But other than that, there really aren't that many disadvantages to the mounted position. Let's talk about um, attack sequences from the mount. So you got to mount what are you going to do to attack someone? Even in like a no gi situation, okay? Like there's no gi to grab. There's no, no jacket to strangle your opponent with. What can we do? The first thing that, uh, that I would look to do is start trapping my partner's wrists and either looking to pin a wrist away from the body or pinning a wrist across the body. And usually what will happen is you can pin your partner's wrist to the floor using a uh, what Gordon and Dan Hershow is a cross wrist grip. So if you imagine you're on top, my right hand would be going across the center line, pinning my partner's right hand, which would be on my left side. So if you pin, if you pin in this way, now your partner's arm is working, your pinning pressure is working against the small muscles in their back, their rotator cuffs. Whereas if I pin on the same side, they're able to keep their arm tight to their body and it's really easy. Well, I'm not gonna say really easy, but it's harder to pin the wrist to the floor. So a cross wrist grip is what Danaher and Gordon show. And it truly is effective. And usually when I'm hitting this cross wrist pinning, I have like an upright posture. Like I'm not crushing my partner with weight, putting weight over the head, but more I'm sitting right upright and I'm starting to pin wrists and then my partner will start to defend that. And then you can come underneath and pin the other wrist and then they'll defend that. And you can keep cycling through cross wrist gripping until you pin a wrist away from the body. Now, usually from this position, once you piss, once you piss, once you pin a wrist to the floor, you can start looking to set up your underhook, which would be the next step, right? Pin the wrist, get an underhook, or you pin the wrist and you can threaten like a, an Americana attack. Your partner will commonly turn to defend the Americana by look, joining their hands together. And then from there, what you can do is you can hit that gift wrap position where you sort of move in behind your partner's head and trap your partner's arm across their face, okay? And in this situation, you can transition right to the back using the so-called gift wrap position, or uh, some people call it the seated head and arm. 
at least that's what Danaher calls it. And then from there, you can take the back from the seated head and arm. When you have that position, you can move your legs into a couple of different situations. You can get rear triangles and front triangles. You can go into jujigatames and all types of all types of different things. So if your partner, if you pin your partner's wrist to the floor, either go for an underhook or threaten an Americana and your partner will quite often turn to defend the Americana. And then from there, you can trap your partner's wrist, the other, the free wrist that has come across their center line. Okay. Um, gaining an underhook from mount. So let's say you did pin their wrist and you punch an underhook. A common reaction that's going to happen is your partner is now going to take, you know, their arm is over their head and they're going to try their best to close that elbow. Because just in terms of good defensive structure, generally when elbows are closer to the body, that is a stronger position than when the arms become more extended. Ideally, what we're looking to do is get to a position called the single chest wrap, where our partner's elbow is literally glued to the top of their head. Okay, I'm just making like a head and arm shape right now. For those of you who are listening, that is the goal. Get to a head, uh, head and arm position, a single chest wrap. So your partner's obviously not going to want this to happen. They're going to be clamping their arm tight and downward. And so, you know, a lot of people show this like Adam's family hand, right? Walk the fingers across like the thing or whatever that creature was called. Uh, but you'll find that you don't really get a lot of power off of that, especially with someone who's trying to close their elbow. It's a very isometrically strong position to just close your elbow to your body. And if you don't want your arm to go over your head, it's hard to make someone do that. So uh, Gordon shows in his instructional this ratchet method which is really, really useful. And basically the mechanics of the ratchet are he gets his underhook, his partner's clamping down on the underhook and he posts his hand on the floor. And then from this position, he moves his head across the center line and straightens his arm like a ratchet. So he just he keeps his hand planted, he straightens his arm, moves his head across the center line. Then he walks like the thing from the Adams family. Then he does it again. And he keeps doing this movement across the center line and his, his, uh, his partner's head, or pardon me, his partner's elbow just gets jacked up and the hand moves across the center line. You can easily move into your single chest wrap. So once you get this um, single chest wrap position, this is a great position to hit submissions. We can go into katagatames, right? Uh, or head and arms as they're more commonly known, arm triangles. This is also a great time to start thinking about either transitioning to a mounted triangle or you could go into a double chest wrap, which is where you're going to perform that same ratchet action on the secondary arm. So usually when I get to the single chest wrap from mount, I sort of assess the situation and I ask myself, okay, do I feel like a head and arm is viable here? Okay, a lot of the time it is, and that will be my first opening play. I'll try and go for the single head and arm. There will be times sometimes where I feel like, okay, that was really easy to get my partner's elbow over the head. I'm going to now... Uh, apply almost a cross face like pressure into my partner, into my underhook, and then switch my focus to the secondary arm where we can again perform that ratchet method to get our partner's second elbow up and over their head. Uh, and then once both elbows are up connected to the crown of the head, we have the double chest wrap. From the double chest wrap, we can move into a really high mount by sliding our knees up to the crown of our partner's head and start pivoting into a perpendicular angle and hitting our S mount. From the S mount, we're gonna have arm bar opportunities. All right, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, uh, what Dan Hur calls the four by four mounted system. It's a sequence that he uses, pin the wrist, get an underhook, single chest strap, double chest strap. At any time, if your partner bucks you and you feel like you have to let go to post your hand on the floor, and you lose it, you just basically repeat the process again. You just reset the system, but you always maintain uh, control from there, okay? So there's nothing wrong with having to let something go to post out. You just repeat the process again. You might be asking like, well, why would I progress to a double chest wrap just to go for an arm bar when the arm bar is arguably less controlling than a triangle or an arm triangle? And that's a fair question, okay? But just keep in mind, putting someone in an S mount with two arms over their head makes them incredibly weak. When you have only one arm over your partner's head, the other arm can still hit, create a cross hip post or frame on your hip. So they could still potentially have a frame that manages distance. Once two arms are over their head, that is like a truly controlling position. So let's just 
talk about arm bars from S mount for a moment. Quite often you'll go into a position where you get to the S mount, you cut your angle, and now you're on your partner's shoulder line. This is like a game over position, or at least it should be. And you're pinching your knee to your heel and you've got a full S mount. And the arm that you want is covered by the secondary arm. So if I wanted to attack someone's left arm, the right arm is in the way, okay? And now we wanna apply the arm bar, but we can't, or sorry, it would be the other way around. We wanna we want to apply the arm bar, but our partner's other arm is blocking them. Okay, it's not really an issue. In this case, we just swim through and pass the secondary arm across our center line to the other hip, or we can physically grab the wrist and pass it to the other side. And then from here, we'll have an unguarded primary arm that we're gonna look to arm bar, okay? Um, another great rule that Danher talks about is never go for an arm bar from the mounted position unless you can see your partner's armpits and tricep muscles. So if your partner's elbows are somewhat down, it's not a time to go for an arm bar. Even if it feels like the arm bar is there, uh, you won't really have the same amount of control as you go for the arm bar. He talks about like fundamentals class where beginners, you know, they do that drill where they're sitting on their in a mounted position, they kind of spin and throw their leg over and and fall back with the arm bar. Okay. This is kind of like a speed-based attack. And the the reality of this type of an arm bar for mount is that uh it's never gonna work. Even at like the blue belt level, it doesn't work. Okay. Even at the lower levels, these types of arm bars never work because the bottom player knows what the top player wants, right? And so what we really need to achieve is the double chest wrap where our partner's elbows are way over our partner's head and we can we've exposed their armpits and their triceps. Once we see those triceps, that's a, a good indication that there's enough control to go into S mounts. Another thing you're going to see, like just for the most basic beginners, and especially for kids, if you coach kids, when we get to arm bar position, I see a lot of kids go for the arm bar when their foot is trapped in a three quarter mount, which seems silly. But if you're a coach, you've probably seen this before. And the, the problem with going for an arm bar when the foot is trapped even if the arm seems readily available, they spin and go for the arm. They realize as they fall that their opponent has their leg trapped. So they can't pinch their knees together. They can't lock their feet together if that's what they like to do. They can't really wedge with their legs. And so their partner almost always slips the elbow out. And if they come up on top they get, um, and it's IBJJF, it's a sweep because it was from a guard. I'm like, hey, you, just, you know, little Billy, you just swept yourself because you went for an arm bar when your partner had your guard, had a guard, even if it is just your foot, okay? So I always say, hey, if you're in a three-quarter mount, don't go for a, an arm bar, like free your leg first, get your points, and then go for the arm bar. And then that way you'll get your score, you'll have control, and you won't get swept. Um, another thing to think about, let's say you're in the S mount, you're trying to go for that arm bar, and from that position, your opponent, uh, or you, you get everything dead to rights, a lot of things you'll see from beginners is they try and do this speed arm bar where they fall off and they try to throw their leg over their partner's head. Now, this can be very, very volatile because if I commit my hips to the floor and I don't have a wedge covering my opponent's head, nothing will stop my opponent's head from rising. And as their head rises, I lose the arm bar. So a great rule to think about if you're gonna commit yourself to an arm bar from the mounted position is don't commit your hips to the floor until you've covered your partner's head with your cross face leg. All right, this is a huge detail. I picked it again. You know, all my mechanics basically are, are from Gordon and Danaher's instructionals. I keep pumping them up, but like, I truly believe that their mechanics are, are you know, some of the best out there. So that's why I reference them so much. And one of the things Danaher talks about is he's like, don't commit your hips to the floor from the top when you go for an arm bar until you cover their head with the cross face leg. And if you do this, you can finish from the top or you can safely fall to the bottom without your partner's head from rising. All right, let's contrast gi versus no gi in the mount position. So as we all know, the gi uh, sucks and should be uh, put away forever. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, gi, the gi provides friction and it makes pretty much every position more and more sticky. And of course, the mount is no different. It makes the mount a horrible position to get out of. It makes kipping escapes harder to do. Not impossible, but harder to do. Um, when you're crossing someone, cross-facing someone with a gi on, it is way more uncomfortable for them because there is friction in their face. Uh, not only are they struggling to breathe, 
but now they're also uh, getting their face graded off with sandpaper and it's just much more uncomfortable. But aside from that, there are added threats when we're grappling in the gi. Of course, there's the cross collar strangle. Okay, cross collar strangle, you know, the Hodger Gracie special, this is like the most fundamental gi jiu-jitsu strangle from mount, okay? Uh, cross collar strangle, great thing about threatening the cross collar is if your opponent is thinking about knee elbow escaping, or any kind of escape, their hands kind of have to immediately come away from your hips and and start addressing the strangle, all right? So you can create a reaction where you can start to expose your partner's arms by threatening such a strangle, okay? Um, it, just as a side note, when we're defending the mounted position, we'll talk about defensive reactions from mount in a, in a second, but the bottom player should be looking to keep elbows in tight, generally get an elbow inside the partner's knee, the mounted player, uh, the mount, the person who's on top getting their elbow inside their knee and having their hands or frames pointing at the mounting, the mounting opponent's belt line. Okay. So bottom player wants to frame the hips of the top player. Now it's hard for the top player to just force the arms up and over the head of the bottom player. It's not an easy thing to do if the bottom player doesn't want to do that. However, you can give them a choice. You can say, okay, you can you can either open your arms up over your head or you can keep your arms where they are, but I'm going to try and strangle you. And if you don't stop me from strangling you, I'm just going to go ahead and try and finish this submission. Quite often, the bottom player will stop framing the hips and they will have to address the submission, okay? And this is a great way to do so. Threaten a cross collar and now the bottom player's hands will start to move up and address the collar grips. From here, the elbows start to come away from the hips Maybe we can get underneath an elbow. Maybe we can punch a full-on underhook. Maybe we can have access to our partner's wrist and just pin it right to the floor, okay? Uh, another option would be the Ezekiel. So in, this, in the gi, in, there are no gi Ezekiels, but it's much less common, okay? I'd say that's a very specialized move. However, I'm not great at the Ezekiel choke, but every time I go to mount in the gi, I threaten it, and either I'm going to get it or I'm going to get my opponent's hands to come up and defend it. And that's just the way it is. If they don't defend it, it's either because they're, they were quicker than me and they already escaped or they've chosen to just double down on the knee elbow or whatever. And now I'm full on Ezekieling them. So the Ezekiel, just like the cross collar strangle, is a great way that we can lure our partner's arms away from a defensive position and bring them up where we can start to peel elbows away from the uh, away from the body and up towards the top of the head. Again, doing this with the method that we talked about, trying to pin a wrist to the floor, getting an underhook, single chest wrap, double chest wrap, etc. Alternatively, let's say you don't have access to the wrist, but quite commonly what will happen is your partner's framing on you and the elbow points from south to out, out to the side. And when this happens, quite often we can slip our elbow or our bicep behind our partner's el uh, elbow and start driving forward with pressure. So their arms might be on the inside, but their elbow's on the outside. Now we're applying pressure on the elbow, it's coming over the head, and this is easily converted into underhook pressure just by driving our weight into our partner's elbow, bringing it away from the hips and up towards the head, okay? so. Everything is going to be about us getting our partners one elbow or both elbows above their head. Now, in no gi and gi, of course, there's uh, a technique that has become very, very popular over the last little bit, and that is the smother. Okay, and I talked about it recently on a on a on a, sh a recent episode that I did. Of course, Big Dan becoming very, very famous for this move. I mean, I actually had a text conversation with him the other night. <laughs> because he saw that I had tagged him in my Instagram reel. And I said, hey, like, uh, he, he came to Vancouver. And I'm like, hey, I just wanted to know, like, that was an amazing performance. He wasn't even trying, you know, when he, when he fought our guys in Vancouver. There wasn't really anyone for him. And very few people this guy's size anywhere in the world who are high-level grapplers like he is. And I said, hey, uh, any tips for <laughs> getting good at the smother? And he said, yeah, step one, be 300 pounds. Step two, smother. Step three, make everyone hate you. Step four, profit. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, thanks a lot. That's really great. 
But uh, he did give you some details on like getting a double cross face position where you can go into the smother. I've been playing with the smother a lot in training and I get it quite a bit. I will say this, it's getting harder and harder to hit the smother, but that does not mean that it's not an effective strangle. Effective meaning I don't always get the submission. Again, I'm not 300 pounds, but I can elicit a reaction. And the reaction that I always get is my opponents, first of all, turning their face a lot because they're trying, they're struggling for their breath. And second of all, their hands start coming up away from their hips and to def uh, and up towards the face so that they can make space and try and defend. And whenever I see that, I just start switching into underhooks, whether it's a real underhook or whether I'm getting underneath the elbow and giving forward pressure, uh, bringing the elbow over the head. So the smother is kind of like the nogi version of the Ezekiel or the cross strangle in that it creates reactions. If you've ever been put in a smother, it's a horrible position. Uh, generally what I like to do when I get to the smother is I get my single cross face position. I have no underhooks. Then as I can put my partner's nose into the center of my chest, I take a second underhook and you're basically trying to, trying to crush their face <laughs> with the center of your chest. And if you're wearing a uh, rash guard, quite often your rash guard will harbor a lot of sweat and moisture. Now that is going into the nose and the mouth of the person on the bottom. It's demoralizing them. It's making them panic. Uh, you will get taps doing this move. I, I do get my fair share of taps, but more importantly, it creates discomfort, it creates panic, and it creates reactions, which is really what I would like to go for. But, uh, well, truthfully, I'd like to finish them with a smother, but uh, I, I will take a, an underhook if that's what I get out of it, okay? Um, <clears throat> let's talk about some controls. So, like I said, controls and understanding your opponent's defensive reactions are really what's going to help you hold the mount position for long periods of time. So let's just talk about hip position. Sometimes you'll be driving your hips into your partner and sort of grapevining them or crossing your feet underneath and you're really, you're, you're hipping in, pushing your hips into your partner's hips and flattening them to the floor. I do this a lot when I'm feeling that my partner is doing a lot of explosive bridging. Um, alternatively, sometimes I'll be riding my partner's hips and I feel that bridges are coming and I may choose to actually lift my hips up slightly. So if I'm putting a lot of weight down on my partner's hips and they're able to bridge, that is when I'm going to feel every bit of that bridge. However, if I can just like time it so that I lift my hips up a couple of millimeters or inches off of my partner's hips, I create a disconnection that prevents them from hitting a strong bridge and a strong Kazushi. So sometimes my hips will be driving my partner's hips into the floor and I just want to calm them down. Other times I feel like they're bridging and I can't drive their hips to the floor and I just sort of like ride with them. So as they bridge, I just lift up, I come back down. I lift up, I come back down. They're using lots of energy and I'm just sort of riding these Kazushis, okay? Uh, let's also talk about high mount versus low mount, okay? So sometimes we're going to be in a high mount position like I talked about where we have our partner's elbows peeled away from their body. Other times I'll be in a low mount, usually when I haven't had control of my partner's elbows yet. So if I do have control of my partner's elbows and they're over their head, I'll transition a high mount as soon as I can. Anytime I can, even if I have like double unders from the half guard position and I pass, when I pass, I'll probably try and pass right to a high mount because I'm already underneath my partner's elbows. Uh, if I'm going to mount and my partner has a good defensive posture with his arms, I'll stick around in low mount and then work my stuff to try and lure my partner's elbows away from their body. Um, so Gordon shows when he's cross wrist pinning this high postured position where he's basically sitting straight up on his partner's hips. And when you do this, it's very, very hard for your partner to hit kipping escapes because your weight is back. Okay, and what this is going to create is a reaction from your partner to start immediately going into knee elbow escapes. When your partner hits a knee elbow escape, that is when you're going to come in and start cross facing them and putting weight on their head and shoulders. If your partner is good, they will recognize that the weight is now shifted from back to forward onto their head and they're going to transition immediately into kipping escapes. So they're cycling from kipping escapes to knee elbow escapes and knee elbow escapes also work kind of universally with the leg trap escape, which is very, very common. So leg trap and knee elbow, both are used when your partner is kind of hanging back. When your partner comes forward, it's gonna be very hard to hit any knee elbows, but that's the time to hit a kipping escape. So I almost feel at this at this point in my journey that 
you know, if you really want to be a quote master of escaping mount, you need to have the kipping escape nowadays. Okay. If you, if you don't, I think so many people don't know how to do that escape because I was one of them until about, uh, I would say four months ago, I started really using the kipping escape. Now it's like my favorite escape from mount. And all I'm doing is cycling between knee elbow or leg trap escape and the kipping escape. Um, so <clears throat> weight over my partner's head and shoulders. If I put my weight on their head and shoulders, they should be kipping. If I sit my weight back, they should be knee elbowing. On the other side of that token, if my partner is knee elbowing, I know that I should be driving weight forward. Then I feel them start to go into a kip. I put my hands on the floor. I start pushing my hips down towards their feet to crush their kipping escape. And so the cycle continues. So this is, this cycle is, uh, is a dilemma that is used both from the attacker or the defender's perspective, okay? Um, understand that from the mounted position, everything about the mount position is the battle for the inside elbow. So if my partner on the bottom is going to escape mount, they have to get one elbow inside of my knee. And that is just like almost unnegotiable, okay? If my partner elbow, if my partner's elbows are away from their body and mount, first of all, I can just punch under hooks. Okay. Second of all, if their, if their elbows are on the outside position, they can never actually frame to get enough space to bring a knee inside. And really that's the goal. They're trying to bring a knee inside so they can recover their guard. Right. And the only way that they can bring a knee inside is if they have an inside elbow position. Okay. So it, they might have their hands on framing on two hips, hip bones like this. If they do this and their elbows are out, I can punch under hooks and they'll be structurally very weak, pressing me away from them. If their elbows are glued to their ribs, ribs, now I know, okay, there's a potential here. They have inside elbow position. Now they could use this double hip post to kip me off. I know the kipping escapes coming. So usually when I feel something like that, I just post two hands on the floor and I sit my butt back, okay? Now they might switch into something like a cross hip post, where they either have two hands going across on two hips or they're going to do a, uh, a box frame post where they have one arm going across the center line, one arm go, uh, reframing that, that post and then looking to get an elbow inside. If I see a cross hip post or a box frame post, generally I feel like my partner's about to get on their side and they're trying to go into a knee elbow or a leg trap escape. And so I come in and I cross face them, okay? Um, Pretty, pretty basic stuff here, but generally, as a, as a general rule, bottom player is trying to get an elbow to the inside position of the knee so that they can start working escapes, and it's up to the top player to take that away by dominating that inside space, getting their knees inside their partner's elbows, and now their arms are on the outside. They just can't make space, okay? This is one of the most fundamental concepts for uh, controlling and escaping the mounted position, all right? Um, also... Sometimes you will have underhooks, which we've talked about, single chest wrap, double chest wrap, but sometimes you'll just be going cross face only. So again, if my partner is going to hit a knee elbow escape, they not only have to get an elbow inside, but they have to get on their side. They can only do a hip escape if they get on their side, right? So if I see that my partner is starting to turn to the side and get uh, get an elbow inside, I know they're going to do a knee elbow to that side. Quite often what I'll do is I'll just very aggressively cross face them and turn their face in the other direction. And when I do that, they cannot do a knee elbow anymore because their face is now turned in the other direction. However, a good player will immediately go into a kipping escape. And so I'm prepared for this. I either sense, can I immobilize this person with a cross face? Or if the kipping escape is coming, I just now put my hands back on the floor. I sink my ass back towards their legs and repeat the, uh, uh, the weight distribution, head over hips or head, or, sorry, weight over the hips or weight over your partner's shoulders as we did previously discussed here. Okay, um, <clears throat> so using, uh, using a, uh, let's talk about using a technical, technical mount or a long hook. And when we're gonna use a technical mount, technical mount is a position where you're kind of side on and you have one knee up, one knee down, okay? Or a long hook is where, you have one of your legs wrapped underneath your partner's body, but you're to the side. So anytime I see that my partner is going to hit a really strong knee elbow and I don't have the time to flatten the back out with a cross face and I'm not able to punch an underhook in this situation, then we can switch to a technical mount or a long hook. And once you move to this position, there 
it's very, very hard to hit a knee elbow skate. Now you might say, okay, well, uh, surely there, like, there's gotta be something that I can do when my partner switches to a technical mount. Like, how do I escape then? If my partner has switches to a technical mount and I can't do a knee elbow, what am I supposed to do? You're actually supposed to switch into a kipping escape. So what Gordon says to do is now start to do a side kip. So you're turning to your side, the guy goes knee elbow, you're gonna kip and then turn back towards your partner. So you're gonna start a side kip and then actually diagonally kip over your shoulder and turn towards your partner and it's actually shockingly easy to bring your knee inside and go into an ashigarami. Why is that? Because when your partner switches to a technical mount or a long hook, they're making one knee up, one knee down generally, they're transferring their weight all the way to their back leg, which means that the leg that they've posted in the technical mount, yes, it's very, very hard to hit a knee elbow because of the position of the leg. However, they've committed all their weight to the rear leg. So now because the weight is committed to the rear leg, we can easily turn towards it and start kipping, kipping, kipping into that side. So if your partner switches to a, a long hook or they switch to a technical mount, a kipping escape to the other side is the correct response. Again, this is all predicated on the idea that your arms are in the inside position. If your if your elbow is not in the inside position, then you're not gonna be kipping or knee elbow escaping at all. Okay. Um, also, let's just keep in mind when we're controlling mount, sometimes we will get caught in the guard, okay? It's not a bad thing as long as you backtrack. And backtracking is a concept that is relatively new for me Something Gordon talks about in his half guard passing. Backtracking is essentially giving your opponent a small minor victory, but not giving them so much that they can get back to a full reset and reset the offense, uh, reset the offensive defensive cycle back to a neutral cycle or not letting them recover to a guard where they could actually become offensive with. So let's say, you know, I feel like my partner hits a knee elbow escape from Mount. Okay. So they trap my leg. They put me back in any elbow escape. That's okay with me as long as on the way out, I steal an underhook and I convert it to a chest to chest half guard. If you have confidence in the half guard controlling position, then you should feel confident going to that position and being able to hold your partner and passing from there. So I've, I've really worked on my cross face and underhook passing from the half guard uh, pin position. And if my partner does recover from mount, I actually don't look at it as a bad thing at all. I look at it as another opportunity for me to use time and pressure over my partner and another way to score from that position. I know that if my partner does recover from that half guard position, they're either going to be exhausted and I'm going to be able to take advantage of it the next second uh, or or they're not going to be able to recover at all. They're just going to get their guard passed from there. Okay, so you really should dial your game in for half guard passing. It works hand in hand with positions like the mount position. Okay, um, backtracking into half guard control or the half guard pin position is a very available position usually when your partner recovers from mount. Okay, there are some exceptions. Let's say they go to like a deep half. It can be difficult to go to half guard control, but a lot of the time when your partner hits a classic knee elbow, you can insert your hand into the underhook position and just backtrack into half guard control pinning position. Let's also talk about three quarter mount for a second, because this position is another situation where your partner, could, again, go into deep half and knee elbow back there, back to uh, a neutral half guard and whatnot. So if you do get caught in a three quarter mount, I've discussed it on the show before, I think the best thing to do is to turn your knee in and bring your butt outside of your knee. So you have this sort of like, how should I explain it? Your leg is trapped, don't have your knee pointing out. If your knee is pointing out, your partner can easily make that a weightless knee and they can sort of knee lever you, lift your knee off the floor, turn their knees towards you and get their neutral half guard back or get their deep half guard back. Instead, you wanna put weight on that knee so that they cannot easily just lift it by bringing your hip to the outside of the knee. Almost like you're dropping your hip to the outside and just crushing your partner's two knees together. Okay, we can do lots of leg riding from here. Craig talks a lot about this, this leg ride concept from uh, power ride instructional that we talked about. 
Um, and from here, you can again, pass right to mount. You can use a strong cross face to get there. Sometimes you can punch underhooks. Okay, sometimes there's rolling back takes, although I avoid that now because I prefer to stay on top, but the purple belt, Matt Kwan, would definitely go for rolling back takes from there. There's tons of things you can do from there, but at least your partner is not recovering to a neutral half guard, okay? Just by turning your knee in and bringing your hip over the outside of your knee, you're able to just crush their legs together and then um, basically progress to the next position. Like I said, at any point, if you feel like you're going to go over or you feel like your partner's going to reverse you, there's nothing wrong with just posting your hand on the floor and resetting the position, okay? If you're in mount, your partner off balances you so much that you're going to fall over and you lose the underhooks, just post your hands on the floor and reset the position. All right, let's talk about foot position. So there's a, a position called jockey mount, and that's where your two feet are going to be on your partner's hips. This is great because it totally prevents your partner from hitting any kind of a leg trap escape. Feet on the hips is a good thing. Another thing is, uh, let's say I have a single chest wrap and I'm wrapping my partner's head and arm. You might feel in this position like your base is very narrow because your hands are dedicated to locking around your partner's head and arm. So whenever this happens, a strong bridge to the side could potentially... Um, could potentially knock you over. And so what you can do is you can back heel on the opposite leg. So if my if I feel that my partner is going to bridge me to my right side, I can pull with my left foot on my partner's leg and that's actually going to prevent me from falling off. Okay? Start to develop a sense of of feel with your with your feet as you back heel and your partner's bridging you from side to side pull your heel to your butt and notice how much base this is giving you because sometimes we have positions like a single chest wrap or an underhook and we don't want to put our hands on the floor because that we know that we, we're in such a good spot. We can use our legs to give us extra base as our opponent bridges. Uh, a lot, another common thing people do, they just touch their big toes together like dead toes, uh, shoelaces flat on the floor, touch the toes together or we could even cross our ankles like a closed guard. I use this quite a bit. Or we can grapevine. Like I said, if your partner is aggressively bridging from side to side, you can weave your shoelaces in behind your partner's calves. These are all good foot positions. Another thing I just wanted to mention real quick is your head position. Think about this. You know, if your head is on your partner's center line, you've mounted them, your head is on your partner's center line. Really, if your partner traps your arm, they could potentially roll you to either side. Okay. However, if your head is on one side, let's say you have a cross face and you've put your head on the other side. Now your head is on one side of the center line. You post your hand out. This means because your head is on the other side of the center line, they will not be able to bridge you to the opposite side because your weight is so far committed to one of the sides that you can predict which way your opponent can bridge you. But they also can't bridge you to the other side because you usually have a handout to post. So generally speaking, if I'm holding the mounted position, I like to have my head slightly off center. So I know where my opponent can and can't bridge me and I can predict when those bridges are going to come. Okay. Um, let's compare mount versus back because there's this age old debate in jujitsu about what is more dominant, mount versus back? And when uh, Lex Friedman had Hodger Gracie on his podcast, he was debating with this, with, with Hodger about this. And Hodger was like, no, like back control is great, but uh, mount mount is my preferred position. And, and Lex is like, oh yeah, but so many more, you have actually way more finishes from the back. What do you have to say about that? And Hodger's like, yeah, that's because they, they hated my mount so much that they just gave me their back. So I finished from there. But really Hodger was saying mount is the most dominant position. Okay. And I tend to agree, especially in fighting mount, I think is the most dominant position aside from rear mount when you're opponent is facing down in the prone position. So essentially the most dominant position that I think in all of combat is when your opponent is facing down in the mount and you're on top and you can do whatever you want to them. Okay. That's the worst position to be in your opponent. You're mounted your opponent, but they're facing away from you facing into the ground. So the back control is obviously a super powerful position because it's very hard for your opponent to attack you and you're behind your opponent. They can't see you. They can't see what your hands are doing. It makes sense, right? That's why it's so strong. Um, but keep in mind that back control often gives the bottom player a sense of mobility. Like a lot of the time when you're taking the back, you're, you will both be facing up towards the ceiling. And in this case, your opponent's not really carrying your weight anymore. Yes, they're, you're, they're carrying your hooks, but they're not carrying your body weight. And furthermore, 
um, uh, the, the back control does not allow you to affect your opponent's breathing unless you're using something like a muffler, which is where you cover your partner's face, okay? This is only allowed in certain competitions. I believe only ADCC. I don't even think it's allowed in EBI anymore. I think Eddie Bravo took it out because he said hands are dirty or whatever, which is true. Um, but in IBJJF, you're not allowed to cover the breathing holes at all, okay? So uh, some differences there between back and mount. I used to favor back more. Now, I much rather prefer mount. I feel like mount is a much more static position. Again, I can cover my partner's face with my chest. Uh, I feel like it's more morally defeating to hold someone in the mounted position. Getting to mount, usually we're going to get to mount through the half guard position. Usually I'm going to try and get a cross face and underhook. Then I, from that cr basic cross face and underhook, I like to switch my head to the other side of my partner's head, convert that cross face to a head block. And then from there, it's so easy to get double unders. Once you get double unders, just tripod and cruise right to mount position. And I recommend cruising to a high mount position. Because you have double unders, there's no chance that your partner can hit a knee elbow escape. And then from that situation, there because there's no knee elbow escape, there's nothing stopping you from going to a high mount. Same thing from side control. If I had a side control with a cross face and underhook, I think the crucial detail is, do you have your partner's near arm shelved on your leg? So if your partner has an inside elbow on the near side, not a good time to go to mount because as you step over, they'll hit a knee elbow, they'll start entering ashigarami, right? However, if you have got an inside position on that arm and you've isolated the near arm with your leg, meaning your near, the near arm is trapped with your knee shelving their leg, uh, pardon me, knee shelving their arm and your knee is at uh, around the crown of their head, now, when you mount, there is no near uh, near side knee elbow escape. So you you could easily mount right into a high mount position. Again, it's all about the inside elbow, right? We, we If we can get inside our partner's elbows, they can't hit a knee elbow escape. That is the main thing. So usually when I mount, I'm mounting from side control if I have the near arm shelved or if I have double unders through the half guard. Sometimes you can, you can mount from a single underhook in the half guard, but it is more volatile because your partner could potentially frame with the near side inside elbow, okay? Um, let's also talk about the constraint-led approach. <laughs> what what episode of the Essential Jiu-Jitsu podcast would be complete without a mention of the uh, ecological approach, right? So the constraint-led approach for, to develop mount, I've found this approach incredibly um, helpful in developing the static positions. So anytime I need to develop skills in immobilization, whether it's like pinning from side control, pinning from mount, pinning from half guard control, if you can develop games to from these positions, you can really increase uh, experience and skill just by these uh, just by these games. So you could do games from mount in, of immobilization where the top player is literally just holding mount where they're allowed to like, you know, do whatever they need to do to hold mount, but their whole job is just to maintain mount position. Like don't dismount to side control. Don't even submit your opponent. Just see if you can hold mount. Then you could add constraints to the game. So now you could say, okay, now instead of just holding mount position, top player, your job is to bring your partner's arm over their head or both arms over their head. If you do that, you win, right? The bottom player, of course, is trying to either recover their guard or reverse the top player. And then you could add another step to this. You could say, okay, top player's goal is to submit the, the person on the bottom. If you do that, you win the game. You could also start in full-on single chest wraps, double chest wraps. You could start in actual head and arms. I know Greg does this, talks about starting from head and arm positions. And he's saying, okay, your job is to finish a submission here, bottom player, you're trying to escape. So obviously in such late stage positions, the bottom player is going to be getting fucked up pretty badly uh, and getting submitted regularly. But the top player gets to hone in their controls and finishing those late stage submission sequences bottom player is able to work on late stage defenses, even though they're probably going to get submitted the majority of the time. So we can practice immobilization, limb extension, and submissions using the constraint-led approach in pinning positions like mount. And what you'll see in your students is like, they immediately start to understand uh, how to control the position because they're getting that immediate feedback with live resistance as we gamify the mount position. Understand that 
the mount is kind of a feel thing. Just like anything in jujitsu, it takes time to develop, but the skill of pinning is such a feel thing. Like it takes, um, it really does take experience. And I find that it's a, it's a skill that a lot of people neglect in jujitsu. I know I did. I wasn't really known as for, for pinning until I got my black belt. Okay. I was more known for like movement based game, but once you start really buying into the whole skill of pinning, you notice that your game changes. It kind of, kind of turns into that cliche of old school jujitsu where you're trying to just use pressure over time. You're trying to take away movement as opposed to allowing movement to happen. And this game, uh, this type of skill, this game is much more forgiving for older athletes. Um, and just, I think as we get into like the brown, the black belt phases, we develop more of an appreciation for the ability to just hold someone down for long periods of time. When I was a purple belt, it was like, I want to get the submission. I want to get it now. I want to submit you as fast as I can. I want to get you know, spectacular submissions and sequences and whatever. And then I started getting older, getting in my thirties, you know, and fighting guys who are really good, really hard to just catch submissions on. You're like, uh, I see the value in just kind of just immobilizing someone just holding them down and making them suffer and using, using uh, exhaustion as a weapon, right? I would say for those who are trying to develop Mount, don't think about like, oh, I got to submit someone for Mount. First, focus on maintaining control. Gamify the mount position and focus on control first. Then start looking for limb extension, then focus on submissions. Because if you're going to focus on submissions first um, and you don't have that control piece, it's going to be very, very hard to spend long periods of time in the mount position. Uh, spe spend a lot of time developing mount. Not just mount, half guard passing, all types of pins, north, south, side control. I believe that like gamifying these positions and spending lots of time here with your students, especially even in the beginners phase, get your beginners working mount early so that they don't look at that position as like a precarious position where they're going to fall off every time they go there, get them going there, teach them how to, you know, what are the reactions of the bottom player? What does the bottom player need and how can we take away those needs so that we can hold that position for long periods of, for long periods of time? Another thing I like about it, uh, teaching mount to kids and beginners is it develops a certain mental toughness and uh, it, it, it kind of teaches them, hey, like I know it's a claustrophobic position, but there are ways out and we have to be comfortable being put in this position so that now throughout their whole journey, they know that if they end up in the most dominant position, they will have confidence and awareness and, and uh, be comfortable enough to get out of these positions. They're not just going to shut down and immediately turn over and give their back, which is what everyone does, right? Everyone allows, as they start framing, they allow their elbow to come across the center line. Now their back is exposed, right? So make sure we teach them, get the elbow inside, keep your frames disciplined, keep your uh, structure small and start getting on your side, getting your hips. They start cross facing you, make sure they learn how to kip. So even like with my kids and beginners, even though it's an advanced and somewhat novel technique, I try to get them to do the kipping movement so that they understand, you know, what they should be doing when their partner is crushing their face. It can be very difficult to hit to hit knee elbow escapes and leg trap escapes when your face is getting crushed, turned away and flattened, okay? Um, nowadays, you know, I seek mount as my favorite top pin position. I, I love it. I prefer it over side control. Um, I really do like half guard passing, of course, but I look at half guard passing as a, uh, just, just as a sort of a pit stop on my way to mount. I love going to mount. And again, it, just very recently, I preferred the back to attack more. Now, I love going to mount, covering my partner's face, using time and pressure uh, to, to break my opponent, block their airway. And it's it's amazing when you get good at mount, how much confidence you feel in the top position. Because you know when you get there, you're like, oh, I'm safe. I'm not. It's not a position that I fear going to because I know I'm going to lose it. But rather, I go there because I love how much pressure and how much discomfort I could cause to my opponent. Again, I'm sounding like a total dick here. Um, and that's basically the show, guys. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you got some tips and some insights to the mount position. You can make it your favorite position, just like I have. Um, you know, uh, uh, please, again, 
wish me luck in Vegas this week. Uh, this episode will be released on Wednesday. So tomorrow I'm doing Masters Worlds. Then on Friday, I'm doing both Jiu-Jitsu Con, Gi and Nogi. Saturday, we got the kids competing. Plus we got the Jiu-Jitsu Grand Prix. I'm hoping to watch Nicholas Marigali and Victor Hugo. I'm thinking that they're the two favorites going in there. Uh, and it's going to be super exciting. Even though it is Gi Jiu-Jitsu, even though it is IBJJF Jiu-Jitsu, I'm still looking forward to it. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy the show. If you guys want to contact or support the show, links are at the bottom. Check out my kid's book. Please subscribe to my online academy. It's 10 bucks a month and it really helps me with the show. If you like the show, if you like the content I give you and you want more of my content, it's 10 bucks a month, right? It's it's uh, it's two Starbucks coffees a month. You get access to my shit and you'll be supporting something that uh, that you like. And I would really, really appreciate it. Anyways, guys, I got to take off. Just remember that the Essential Jiu-Jitsu podcast is everything you need to know about jiu-jitsu. Wish me luck in Vegas. See you guys later.